शैल वी स्टार्ट तो हाय हां जी गुड गुड इवनिंग सर लेट मी प्लीज स्टार्ट सो हाय शीतल हाउ आर यू गुड इवनिंग हाय हाउ आर यू गुड इवनिंग सर आई एम गुड एंड आई एम फीलिंग द ग्रेट एंड प्रिविलेज टू बी योर एंड गिविंग इंटरव्यू एट द सिस्टम ऑर्गेनाइजेशन ओके इट इज अ प्रिविलेज फॉर अस टू टू मीट यंग ब्लड सो प्लीज ब्रीफ मी अबाउट योर कैंडिडेचर शीतल सो माय नेम इज शीतल चतलांगिया आई एम अ रिसेंटली क्वालिफाइड cost management accountant i have cleared cost management accountancy at first attempt throughout all the levels i have done my internship from metro cement and mines private limited which is based in pipar over there the work that i was involved into was preparation of budget cost records and analyzing the variances and the reasons of variances i also suggested improvements for the same i have also done my internship from Hari Bhakti and Company, Mumbai, and P K Jhumera and Company, wherein I was involved with the statutory audit and internal audit division. I have done comprehensive statutory audit for Wokard Limited, which is a pharmaceutical company, and I have uh, extensively done audit in the areas of account payables, account receivables, investments, and banks. We have also visited the manufacturing locations and seen their uh, processes, process walkthrough, business walkthrough, and analyzed the internal controls. in my academic i am i have done my masters in business finance and economics and my bachelor's b com from jnr vyas university jodhpur i have scored 60% plus in both my graduation and post graduation i have done my schooling from st patrick's vidya bhavan which is a branch of the reputed convent school of girls sophia i have been a scholar throughout my academics and also a school dropper in my class 10th examinations during my leisure time i like involving myself in the fields where i can free flow my creativity like painting art and craft i like making distinctive art and craft hand hand crafted products and uh, gifting them to my dear and dear ones it gives me a feeling that i'm more connected to them i also like reading fiction books when i have time and involving myself in cooking because it helps me relax and unwind myself Uh, I am based uh, from uh, from Jodhpur, the blue city of Rajasthan, and uh, that's all from about myself. Okay, good to hear your introduction. Uh, so I can see CA final group two in your CV. So why didn't you complete your uh, CA final studies? Like, what was the reason of dropping the same? Sir, uh, I got involved. I. In into cost management accountancy from twenty twenty and twenty uh, one, and I got to know about this course later, where I discovered that the curriculum is quite same and it's a very booming sector. Earlier, there was not much knowledge or awareness about this in the area where I live. So when I came to know about this and I researched about this, uh, I thought to pursue my career in this, hmm. okay. and I left But my CA because. Uh, I thought let's not uh, float in two boats and just focus in one. And uh, as a result, I did clear my uh, CMA exams in first attempt throughout all the levels. Uh, I feel I I was more focused and determined to do this in first attempt. Okay, great. So, what all areas did you handle? You know, uh, for these organizations like Wokart Limited and uh, Winton Healthcare Limited, like what all different areas did you handle you while auditing the these companies? Thank you for this question, sir. Uh, in Wokart Limited, we were involved as statutory auditors, wherein I, as an article, I extensively uh, surveyed the areas of account receivables, account payables, uh, investments, fixed assets. Uh, expenses in accounts payable. Uh, my work was uh, uh, we used to give uh, debtor uh, confirmations. Uh, we should we were used to send it to different uh, debtors and the same different creditor confirmations to different creditors in order to check whether the balances in our books is tallying with the balances in their books. And we used to uh, uh, we used to follow up with them again and again. If in case they did uh, some of the debtors or the creditors did not give the confirmation, then we used to inform the management and the. Management then used to give a management representation letter. Uh, we we would also check the entries and whether the invoices have been have been uh, has been is there in the system and authorization and the signature of the person is who is who was there 
and if there was any query we we would also go and visit the uh, the client the finance department and ask them about uh, about different uh, different queries in cash and bank balance uh, what we used to see was uh, the bank balances tallying uh, with there used to be a bank reconciliation statement that we used to get and we used to we used to tally if the balances are the same as uh, given in the books and if there are any discrepancies if any uh the, as i was also involved in seeing in going to the manufacturing locations based at aurangabad and seeing the entire process so i saw that the processes were followed very strictly there were the in the, in all the factories we used to go there and uh, uh with with all the setup and even one hair should not be out of that uh, uh the cap that they give us and every uh, we used to see there how the stocks are maintained if all the registers are being maintained properly if the warehouse keeper is maintaining the records of all the stocks the expiry dates uh, have not passed of all of them so the entire process we used to see and uh, also we we did some physical verification of the assets and the stock in i have also done uh, tax yeah that's all for bocard limited okay great so as you said that you have done physical verification of inventory right so yes. assume that we uh, we engage you in one of the assignments where you have, where you have to do physical verification of the inventory and we have uh, provided you with uh, you know data wherein uh, there are just three rows in that particular sheet the first row speaks about the item of inventory the second row speaks about let's say the quantity of that particular inventory item and the third row speaks about the location of that inventory right so you have this sort of sheet uh, the sheet basically is extracted from sap uh, uh, which clearly speaks about what all uh, stock items are available in the warehouse while physically verifying the inventory in the warehouse you came to know that there are excess number of units available for a particular stock what could be the possible reasons for the same let's say if the management is not able to answer uh, you know this question uh, how will you assess the situation and what could what could be the possible reason what could be the possible reasons in this case uh, according to be the possible reasons can be as follows first of all uh, there might be possible that the the vehicle which was received for 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 in which we had to load the goods and uh, send them to the uh, customers or the uh, the the recipients the, the storage capacity of that vehicle was not sufficient to fill in Uh, all the stuff. For example, the order was of hundred units, and the capacity of the truck was only for eighty units. So those twenty units are still lying in our warehouse, but it but sale has been done, so it is appearing in our books uh, as the item is sold. There can also be a re uh, reason as to uh, negligence on the part of the staff or staff uh, involved in the warehouse that they did not. Uh, recorded properly the invoice uh, quantity was was wrong or uh, or fault on their part that they did not they did not load all the items actually the order was of 100 and they should have filled the uh, the truck with 100 units but uh, uh, they saw it wrong they they, they confused it with some other in, uh, invoice or order and they uh, uh, filled that truck uh, wrongly there can also be reason of civil disturbances uh, there might be civil disturbances that time or uh, any any uh, assuming they they can be a natural uh, uh, calamity also no no there is nothing like natural calamity or civil disturbance it's a normal case that when we are physically verifying the warehouse we are able to find more inventory than what it's supposed to supposed to be as per the books so one is fine there is some clerical error that they have made while booking that inventory that is point taken what ends so the storage capacity point i have given and uh, other points they can be there might be some issue regarding uh, the the there might be some confusion regarding uh, the orders so that's all i can think of right now okay fine fine okay so what is the difference between you know statutory audit that you used to do and the cost audit like is there any difference between the two 
Uh, yes, sir. Uh, there is a difference in statutory audit. Statutory audit only chartered accountants can do, and statutory audit we see the financial statements, which involves our balance sheet, P and L, uh, cash flows, most to accounts. Uh, so we go through them and we uh, we see and compare them uh, with our previous year uh, records, and uh, we prepare an entire uh, audit documentation because in statutory audit the main uh, purpose of the auditor is to give an opinion as to the financial statements are prepared in a true and correct. manner so they will give an opinion in the audit report that the uh, uh, that uh, that all everything that everything is fine and uh, it's a clean report or it might be adverse or they might give a disclaimer uh, but assuming that it's a it's a clean report they 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 go into uh, all the areas and uh, uh, on a materiality basis they will check different items and uh, uh, as, as per that for example there the data balances uh, is uh, is showing different debtors uh, balances showing so they will check with uh, the major debtors as to the balances appearing in our no, no, same as the balances no 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 we are just speaking about we are just discussing I think the difference between stat audit and cost audit. That's all. Okay. Okay. So statutory audit is we are studying the financial statements, uh, and in cost audit, what we do is we see the cost records of the company, and we see if they are prepared as per the cost accounting uh, standards. They pre, uh, they uh, they give us a, a correct picture of all the materials and expenses used, and uh, that only a cost auditor, the cost management accountant, can do. And there is a separate. So both so both that. are done under both are done. Both are done as per Companies Act, right? Yes, sir. Both are done under the same statute. Hence, stat audit is called a stat audit because it is a statutory audit under a statute. Even the cost audit is done under the same statute, which is Companies Act. Yes, sir. Why we call stat audit as stat audit and cost audit as cost audit and not stat audit? But in statutory audit, this is a compulsory thing that we 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 need to do as per the law given in those sections. As per that sections, we have to do. And in cost audit, we are not seeing as to what financials are made and why this thing is there in the financial. And we are not giving our opinion in cost audit. We are and the cost auditor we are checking the uh, the the things of related to cost elements. Hmm. Okay. And, Fine. Even Fine. internal audit is a different segment and under the same statute, but that mm. is governed by a different section. Okay, great. So as you said in your introduction, that you have also done, you know, variance analysis and budgeting work. So what is the basic difference between uh, budgeting and forecasting? So budget means that we are preparing a financial plan in the quantitative terms. For example, if we have one lakh rupees, then how will we allocate it between different? Uh, uh, Different different things like in how much to to be given to the wages, how much to be given towards material, how much to be given towards fixed and budget we prepare on the prepare on the basis of past data. We see the past trend and on as per as per that we prepare the budget and allocate our our uh, this is a budgeted expense that we can afford this month and we allocate them to different units. Forecast is actually a prerequisite for budget. Forecast is that based on our past and present condition, we estimate the future expenses. That okay, in future raw material might increase or raw material might decrease. Uh, there might be changes of uh, because of learning the uh, learning curve, the labor uh, cost might decrease. So as per that, we we estimate our uh, uh, expenses and we estimate our cost, and then we prepare a forecast. After a forecast is made, then we prepare a budget. So that is the difference between the uh, uh, the forecast and budget. Also, the pay time period of of a forecast uh, is usually longer, and budgets can be prepared for short term also, for a month also, for week also, for a year also. So, is it a static activity, both of them, both budgeting and forecasting, or is it a dynamic activity? So it's a dynamic activity. It's not static because uh, uh, the rates might keep on changing, or uh, there might be possibility that the quantity that we uh, thought uh, that much quantity did not get, uh, got sold. So it's a dynamic activity, and we have to keep uh, keep we have to keep updating it. Okay, what is zero based budgeting? So zero based budgeting is that we prepare this budget taking the present condition as a base. We don't consider the past trend. We take uh, that year as a zero base, and then we uh, we prepare the budget. Okay. So why why do we not consider the base, or why don't we take a reference from the last year? What is the purpose of doing zero base budgeting? As for me, the purpose 
for doing zero based budgeting is to get a fresh perspective there might be cases that the company has uh, diversified and now it can't use uh, the old data or uh, uh, the, the conditions of old uh, the previous years is not similar to that of the current year and hence they have to take it a new base they can't take uh, early, the basis of earlier years okay So since you mentioned indices that you converted with indices also, uh, so what is the difference between the erstwhile uh, standard on revenue that means AS nine uh, versus you know the new standard on revenue which is indices one and five? What is the basic fundamental conceptual difference? Okay. Sir, in indices one and five, which is uh, re uh, revenue from contract with customers, we only see the contracts with the uh, we we recognize revenue. contracts with customers and they the from the goods that we are selling and the sales uh, re services rendered to them in the earlier as uh, we also used to consider interest income and royalty incomes but in this in days we don't consider that we categorize it as other income separately also here the revenue recognition is done when the control is transferred in the earlier as the revenue recognition is was done was when the risk and rewards were transferred uh so uh, that is the so in in the new indes uh, uh do you feel that risk and reward concept has been done away with no, or sir, is it, it still is, present it, it is still present it is there in the uh, definition of control but uh, uh, the the segregation and the clarity is more Uh, mm. It's not just that the the risk and reward is transferred and uh, we we'll, uh, we'll book the revenue. They might there are different instances and based on that, uh, uh, company has to take a judgment and uh, book the revenue over a period of time or at a point of time. Okay, fine. So, uh, can there be a difference in transaction price and consideration received? And if yes, what could be different here? Uh, Yes, sir. Here the transaction price is what we are uh, giving the what we think is the probable amount that we will receive. And in earlier years, so uh, we used to record only the consideration uh, that was received. So okay. here, uh, if we are if we have a probable reliable amount that okay we will uh, receive this much amount in future, so we'll record it. For example, if we have given twelve laptops and we think that two laptops will come back to us. So we will not record the sale of ten laptops. We will record the sale of only eight laptops, and for other two laptops, which we think, as per past trend, that they might uh, uh, get us uh, the, the the customer customer might return it. So we will not book the revenue right now. We will book it as a refund liability or an advance income. And then when the time period for return has been closed, then now depending whether the customer is returning us or not, we will then book it as a revenue. This was not done in earlier years. Okay, so let's say taking your example only. Let's say if you are selling ten laptops and each laptop costs fifty thousand rupees, right? So basically, it's a transaction of five lakh rupees. Uh, and there is a probability that twenty percent of the laptops generally are returned by the customer. That's the past trend. How much revenue are you going to book? And what is the transaction price and consideration in this case? Here we will book revenue on bank account, debit to revenue to refund liability. We will book revenue of only eight laptops, eight okay. laptops, and each you said is fifty thousand. So we we'll okay. What is transaction price in this particular contract? So here the transaction price is four lakh rupees. Uh, that and means that uh, four lakh eight eight, eight eight laptops into fifty thousand. Eight laptops into fifty thousand and one okay. lakh is the advance income that we will book. It is not the transaction price. Okay, and then what is consideration? Sir, in consideration, consideration is the entire amount that we have received. Consideration means uh, for the services. Uh, if I go literally, consideration means for that for the services or the goods that we have supplied, the amount that we are receiving uh, for that. So here, the consideration is five lakh, but revenue that we are booking is only four lakhs. Are you sure? Sir, as per uh, my current, uh, uh, as per what I can recall, I am pretty sure. Uh, okay. Fine, fine, no problem. So, uh, are you aware of recent changes in Caro, twenty twenty? Since you have been a stat auditor, that's why I'm asking. Yes, question. sir, but uh, I I'm not updated with the recent changes in Caro. Okay, no problem.
uh, are you aware of recent changes in schedule 3 disclosure norms yes sir oh. can you guide me through few important ones not the name change one or any insignificant uh, changes the important ones okay uh, sir on the face of balance sheet now lease liabilities has to be disclosed under the borrowings in the under the non current liabilities or the current liabilities that is there on the face of balance sheet we also have to uh, give a percentage of the shareholding a percentage of the shareholding pattern held by the promoters of the company and uh, there has also been a, we have also have to give a disclosure of the uh, in 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 the trade in the debtors we have to give a aging of the debtors and we have to segregate them among uh, uh, the amount of which, which we think will be received or uh, which we think will not be received and the aging will 0 to 6 6 to 12 one to two, two, two to three, and uh, now more than three. Even in creditors, same. Similarly, in the notes, we have to give an aging of the creditors. Now, the uh, that is mentioned, uh, and the aging is one to two, two to three, and more than three. We also have to segregate between MSME and the uh, with with uh, undisputed uh, and others undisputed, and MSME and others disputed. So four uh, categories are there now, and also in the notes of accounts. Now we also have to give disclosure about the undisclosed income. The income which is not disclosed in our financial statements but that we disclose as per our income tax account and tax assessment we disclose uh, another thing is about the csr expenditure uh, if a company uh, section 135 is applicable for the company and they are doing a, a csr expenditure so they have to give disclosure as to on what activities uh, they uh, contributed that money to what amount uh, uh, um, uh, they had kept aside but how much amount did they actually invest on those activities so accordingly the shortfall uh, the name Nature, the activity so that is a separate heading that we have to give and uh, that is all that I can uh, remember as of now also there have been changes in the statement of changes in equity now we also have to uh, 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 additionally two more columns have been added as to why the uh, if the current uh, the, the opening balance of current year if there has been changes in that opening balance because of any prior period item changes so even that column is added yeah. You spoke about CSR. So let's say, you know, I'm spending some amount uh, to carry out any CSR activity under law, which is a approved object by the Companies Act. And I am availing some services or goods to carry out that particular CSR activity. Can I claim credit for the same? Uh, no, sir. As per the recent amendments in the budget 2023, we no longer can uh, take uh, ITC of the goods and services that are used or intended to be used for CSR activity. Okay, adding on one more fact here, let's say those uh, purchases were made from MSME vendors. So the uh, vendors through which we bought these particular goods or services or availed services, they were MSME vendors and we had a contract with them. Now due to some internal error or some problem in our system, maybe we were transitioning from one ERP to another. It took us three months to transition. And now we made payment to that MSME vendor in 90 days. Right. After three months, that means, right. Can I claim this expenditure under income tax? Act? Sir, I think uh, we can claim, we, we cannot claim expenditure under income tax act because CSR is not an allowed expense under section 37. So, no, we are not spending on CSR. We are just buying goods and services for carrying out G CSR activity. So, and we are paying after, like, we are paying in 90 days, after 60, 70 days, 90 days. In income tax, we can uh, to take, uh, uh, we can allow that expense. Okay, are you sure? So, uh, just to, to clarify the question, the, we have taken goods and services uh, not for business purpose. So, let's say we are, uh, we are imparting education to, people who are staying in villages. So we have adopted certain villages and their schools, right? And we distribute food and uh, let's say books and stationery and various other things, uniforms. And we are buying these, you know, food, uniform, stationery from vendors who are MSME vendors, right? Now, can I, you know, claim deduction for the amount uh, that I've spent on buying the stationery, etc. amount? No, sir, we cannot uh, because uh, this is not an expense related to the business. 
and uh, the sentence it will not be allowed it and okay let's assume that it is not for csr it's a amount other than csr we have made normal business expenses which is which doesn't pertain to csr activity it's a normal business expense and we are paying off our uh, you know msme creditors in 90 days can i claim the amount in my books now uh, if that business is not of uh, building uh, schools and uh, then I no no i am normal i am itc i am buying something from a vendor normal okay like a normal purchase that i do which is a allowed purchase in the income tax act okay now can i claim uh, this as a deduction in my books yes sir expense yes sir because it's an allowed sure. purchase as hmm. per income tax act sir i'll definitely read upon it uh, okay fine fine understood you have also mentioned you know that you worked on india 16 so uh, are you aware of what is the can you just uh, enlighten me with the concept of component accounting uh, yes sir uh component accounting is the uh, is uh, sir i would like to explain this with the help of an example if you allow uh, for example we have a a jet and in that jet uh, the the engine has different uh, has different uh, useful life and the body of the uh, jet has different useful life so th there can be cases where significant uh, uh, parts have different useful life so in that case it is not necessary that uh, that we will take that entire jet as one pp we can do component accounting we can uh, segregate them and then we will here for say we will uh, uh, we depreciate the uh, the body for example in 5 years and then we depreciating the uh, engine in for example 2 years so there can be a difference like that Hmm. and then okay. later on after 2 years if uh, the engine uh, has to be replaced then that will go for, from the books at carrying value and then replaced at uh, the value of the new engine that is replaced so it is possible if there is different useful life then, and uh, there are significant components so uh, then the component accounting how do you determine whether a particular component is significant component so that is depending on the judgment uh, of the the that particular industry okay fine let's say there is a you know there is one machine and it has a spark plug uh you know the useful life for that spark plug plug is not more than 6 months the useful life machine is 20 years the useful life of that spark plug is plug is 6 months without that spark plug the machine cannot function is it a significant component but it has to be uh, significant as in uh the cost is not a factor uh, that uh, uh, i know here that in uh, for deciding the components the cost is not a factor but uh, uh, there should be some uh, materiality and uh, some uh, some size uh, as per which the the company has to decide like here is that spark plug is like a spare part it is not a entire uh, different segregation so uh, you just now said that uh the cost of that particular thing is not a factor to determine the significance right hello you're not audible your video is stuck okay it's my problem okay am i audible yes sir sorry my uh, internet flung okay. so you you just, i was saying that you uh, just few minutes back you appraised me with the fact that cost is no criteria for deciding whether a particular thing is significant or not right yes sir i i'm just reconfirm yes sir yes sir okay fine assume there is a company and uh, you know the company is a pre revenue company it is basically still into research it's a pharmaceutical company developing a completely new drug to cure cancer assume right it has it doesn't have any revenue because it's a very new company just established two years back still in the research phase it has no expenses assume there are no expenses it is it just has uh, you know it just have a certain machinery Uh, or plants or assembly lines, 
uh, where they are just testing things and nothing else. And it's a depreciable tangible asset. So there is only asset and depreciation. How would the p and and balance sheet would look like in this case? Sir, you're, uh, um, you're asking what will be at what cost we will recognize the no, p No, 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 no. My question is that there is a, assume that there's a asset or maybe assembly line and factories which cost somewhere around 500, 5,000 crores. We are charging depreciation uh, somewhere around 200 crores. In that particular area, it's a depreciable asset. It is ready to use asset. Hence, we are depreciating. We do not have any production. Hence, no revenue. Assume there is no cost or expenses as well. No stock, nothing, nothing. How will the balance sheet and PNL will look like in this case? We'll record it uh, at, at uh, the. Okay, first PNL, please. PNL, the depreciation amount will be disclosed in the PNL. And okay. in and in balance sheet, uh, we will. Uh, so how will you balance out the PNL? Like on one side, you have charged depreciation. Then, like what, what next? How are you going to close the PNL? Like make a PNL for me in this case. Sir, we are doing test sales and we are getting income from. No, we are no. That's what I said. There's no sale. There's no expense. Just asset and depreciation. So there might be a uh, it was two banks the entry mother uh, the, there was a debtor creditor also or it was nothing purchase, no? nothing okay nothing. just depreciation and us okay so two depreciation by P &L. Hmm. And in balance okay. sheet, uh, the asset account divide, uh, less the the asset amount less the depreciation and then the carrying mm. value. Mm. And and bank uh, bank minus uh, for example, we have uh, we have purchased. Okay, it, take so your time. Take thirty seconds. Inside. Take thirty seconds. Draw it in your book, or in your copy. A bank OD on the. There's no bank OD. Inside. Nothing. Nothing. So bank will be on negative. No bank. Zero. Nothing. Uh, but the entry would be asset account debit to bank. So asset was bought two years back. Okay. We so are just depreciating the same. Okay. Provision for depreciation. Okay. Uh, we'll discuss it. Later on, leave it. Uh, so it seems you have also done, you know, GST advisory work. So are you aware of uh, the recently launched QRMP scheme? Yes, sir. I'm deeply aware about it. What What it is all about? Uh, sir, in uh, QRMP scheme, it is quarterly return and monthly payment. Uh, so it mm. is uh, the government has introduced it so as to give a bit of uh, uh, convenience to the taxpayers. And where wherein we have to pay the returns now quarterly, but every monthly the uh, statement will be filed, and uh, it's uh, that depending on different states. Ma'am, you are making a mistake. You are saying you have to pay quarterly and. No return quarterly, quarterly return filing, and uh, payment or statement has to be filed on a uh, uh, monthly basis. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, like ranging different uh, states have different due dates ranging from eleven to thirteen of the next month. For payment? For payment. Okay. Fine. And what is the threshold? Like what sort of a dealer, what sort of SSE can opt for the scheme? Which all SSEs can opt for the scheme? Uh, threshold, I think, was uh, 5 lakh. Uh, 5 lakhs, what? ITC, turnover. Turnover, 5 lakh turnover. Okay, just I five lakhs. Do you really feel, okay? Let's say someone has a turnover of five lakhs. Do they really need to register in GST? I'm sorry, sorry. Yeah. No, they don't need to register in GST. Uh, okay, no I'll, problem. I'll read up on it. No problem. So, are you aware of uh, e invoicing norms, uh, e invoicing scheme? Yes, sir. 
Yeah, please guide me through invoices. Sir, in uh, the invoices scheme that was introduced a uh, year or two years uh, back, in that scheme, uh, there has been thresh different threshold. Uh, if your turnover in from year 2017, 18 to uh, 21, 22 was between this uh, uh, limit, in that case, you have to generate an e-invoice on the portal and uh, uh, as and uh, there will be authorized uh, signatures uh, and there will be b2b invoices uh, it, it is only for b2b invoices and uh, also for uh, uh, i think that there are different thresholds so is it not for b2c limit. invoices at all is it not for b2c invoices at all sir uh, it or for a certain set, 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 set of uh, you know for certain set of b2c invoices you have to generate invoice Therefore, it is mandatory for B two B for if you are mm. if you are for example more than ten crore limit, Fine. so it is mm. uh, mandatory for them. Mm. And uh, uh, they also have mentioned uh, the 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 time limit in which you have to uh, generate it. For if your turnover mm. was more than hundred crore, then you have to generate it within seven days. For others, they have not given a time limit as of now. And mm. uh, in this uh, first phase, generate the uh, the invoice on the portal, and then uh, there has to be authorized signature, and then uh, the 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 it will be reflected on the portal, and then it will also be reflected in the port uh, on the portal of the uh, recipient. So then he can automatically claim uh, ITC. Okay. So to whom is it applicable? Like, what sort of uh, assessees do need to you know? Compulsorily apply invoicing scheme. To be and if your threshold is more than ten crore, that is one. And mm. uh, others are uh, if you are an. Uh, sir, in B two C also there was some criteria, but uh, I am not able to uh, recall. Okay. I'll read upon it. I I have a photographic. Let's say I'm an exporter. In my mind. I am yes, an exporter. exporter. Yeah, so thank you. Thank you so much uh, for giving me a hit. Exporters, if you are an uh, exporter, you you rated supply EOU units, uh, uh, those all, uh, um, it's compulsory for them also. Okay, fine. So uh, let's assume that I'm LNT or I'm ITC. Let's say I'm LNT and I'm building a flyover in Maharashtra. And uh, you are running an engineering firm, a firm of chartered engineers who provide, you know, engineering support to different infrastructure companies. And I'm coming to you and we are signing a contract. Uh, wherein you will help me with designs of that particular flyover. You'll also provide, you know, uh, engineering consultancy, and you'll also supply, uh, you know, skilled manpower if required. And this contract is for one crore rupees. The GST at eighteen percent is chargeable on the same. Uh, now my accountant, my financial reporting team at LNT's end is confused whether they need to deduct TDS number one, TDS under income tax. At what rate they need to deduct TDS? Under which section they need to deduct TDS? What is the due date of paying? Let's say if they deduct TDS, what's the due date of paying this TDS liability to the government? And what is the due date of filing return for TDS? Okay, so uh, I'm uh, segregating a question in parts, so if you allow. Uh, the TDS will be deducted uh, as will be under section uh, 194J, which is for professional services. And uh, the due date for uh, that is uh, uh, for for the months. The due date is uh, the tenth of next month, and uh, for the month of uh, March, it is uh, it is uh, it is April end, and uh, that is the due date of uh, return. And one ninety four J professional services, and uh, it's a uh, form you said. Yeah, your is a firm. 10%, 10%, 10 for TDS rate has to be deducted. Does it matter that whether it's a company or a firm in under section 194J? 
yes yes sir because uh, if you are liable for uh, audit under section 44ab then uh, uh, the rate only then you will fall under this i am assuming that this person was liable for 44ab uh, uh, tax mm -hmm. audit and so mm -hmm. it is falling under 194j and the return the tax rate will be 10% mm -hmm. okay what is the due date of paying the tax to the government Due date for paying is uh, and at what rate do do we need to deduct TDS? You okay, did not describe 10%, the date. Ten percent. Ten percent. Okay, fine. 10%. And when do we need to deduct? When do we need to uh, deposit this TDS liability with the government? Sir, at the time of payment or uh, recording in the books, whichever is earlier, at that time we'll deduct. So the that TDS time we will deduct TDS, right? Yes, right. yes. At that time we'll deduct the TDS and then we'll deposit the TDS to the government. Uh, uh next month due date what's which that is fourth of next month uh, uh i i'm a bit confused between the between so the due dates let's and not the bluff date. let's not bluff let's be honest yeah. say i don't know okay yes, yes sir. i i don't know i'm getting a bit confused between the no problem dates. no problem no problem so, uh, Sheetal, why do you wish to join ITC Tobacco? It's a it's a privileged company. It's a reputed organization, and uh, I am I will be lucky to be a part of such a uh, such a, uh, a group. It has a different different divisions. So, uh, it's it's a it's a actually a household name in India, and uh, mm -hmm. that will be a very good addition to my uh, career as a as a. As a fresh, if I join such a, a reputed brand, it will definitely add feathers to my cap, and it will help me grow. And I wish to grow uh, at till great heights in in this company. I am sure that you must be you must have been shortlisted by some other organizations too, right? Yes. Any particular reason of choosing ITC Tobacco? Yes, sir. The reason is that uh, the, this is uh, again, as I said, it is a very reputed FMCG uh, group of India. So you and, mean that others are not reputed? Sir, others are reputed, but uh, uh, I but this is a this is oh, this is actually a household name, and I have also read about this company, and I have seen the financials how it had how it has grown over the period, how it has diversified in so many sectors and divisions. So. Uh, this is a this is a definitely a, a a good standpoint and uh, th therefore I would be lucky to join this organization. Okay, will you be okay joining a plant location because we generally place uh, students at plant location initially. So yes, being sir, uh, I... being a female, will you be okay going to a plant location? Yes, sir. Definitely, we live in twenty twenty three, and uh, uh, what. Uh, uh, Definitely, females now can uh, do stuffs at par, and uh, we might be different physiologically, but uh, uh, definitely females can match uh, uh, the uh, match males in 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 the capacity of uh, IQ, and uh, there we don't have to do physical labor. It is all about analytical technical skills. So uh, I don't feel there is a uh, that being a female will be a disadvantage for me here. So and have you ever been to a plant? Yes, sir. I have been to plant. I have visited three, four plants of Gokhad Limited at uh, Aurangabad. So I have seen how the pharmaceutical company works. Okay, because uh, you know, in the past, it's mostly uh, the professionals, especially the women professionals, leaving the organization on account of being placed at remote locations. So that's why I thought of confirming. Nevertheless, yes, uh, so uh, where do you see yourself five years down the line? So five years down the line, I see myself in ITC Limited at a higher position, leading a team of young professional minds and guiding them throughout their uh, uh, throughout their journey, and also being a part of the of a uh, of a team which helps in decision making and helping the organization grow to uh, better heights. Okay, and any personal aspirations next five years? Sir, I would definitely want to be uh, as this role is for AM. I would definitely be want to be from uh, I, I I as per my skills and my passion, I feel I will get uh, promoted to manager level. Assume there's a debtor, and uh, that's a one-time debtor. Like 
we haven't had any transaction with that that party in the past and we are never going to have any transaction that was just a one time order and the debtor is still uh, pending in our books like as i said that is that party is a debtor at the moment uh we have tried reaching out to de- to that debtor uh, multiple times we have sent letters reminders frequently we have been sending it frequently every month sometimes twice we have even sent a representative to their office uh the office is open there is no problem with their office they are functioning but uh, our our executive has not been able to meet the finance accounts uh, personnel or the head of that particular client and we are not getting any response over calls mails nothing right what would be your course of action in this case as a manager or as an auditor how many years have passed it's been 8 months now so since it's been 8 eight months i don't think that we should record it as of bad debts right now we can record it as provision for bad debts if we have used all the uh, measures and they are not replying uh, we, at the year we should at the year end we should we can we should record it as a provision and uh, we should uh, continue uh, uh, to uh, have a contact with them on uh, contacting the uh, the head if not uh, the finance head is not replying we can contact to the ceo also mm-hmm. and uh, if the debtor is of a huge amount we should definitely do more measures and not just straight away record it as bad debts but if the if the debtor is of insignificant amount then i don't think we should spend more resources uh, than what we have already spent uh, and mm-hmm. uh, in that case we can record it as bad debts also with that that is a call which we have which the manager management will need to be will need to take as per the uh, amount and materiality involved okay so you scored so well in 12th standard and 10th standard and if i see your percentage in cma it is 54% if i see your percentage in bcom it is just 63% why there is a significant drop in your performance uh post school uh yes sir uh, in our uh, in our university which is jnm yas university uh, the the exam pattern is quite similar to delhi university but uh, the way they check the papers they are not lenient with that at all they check the papers in a very stringent and strict manner and your scoring first division is also considered a great achievement because the proper only goes at around the 70s within uh, 70s and if we see in tus or mumbai universities the toppers grow at 80s and 90s but that is not the case with the uh, jnr and yas university or any university in rajasthan your the year 60% above is considered uh, as uh, an achievement so that is the reason i did study a lot in my graduation and my post graduation and because of that i have scored 62 and 62% respectively okay fine so you what you mean to say is that the yardstick of you know uh, analyzing paper the yardstick is different in school and in college right yes sir So, are you aware of uh, you know Schedule Two of the Companies Act? What does it prescribe? Does it prescribe rates? Pardon, schedule. Does it prescribe Schedule Two of Companies Act? Does it prescribe rates? Yes, sir. It prescribes rates for uh, depreciation. Okay, and let's say if I'm using my uh, machines or assets in three shifts, uh, am I allowed to take accelerated depreciation? But if we are using it in three shifts, uh, we are we we cannot take accelerated depreciation. No. What about income tax? Sir, even in income tax, we cannot take. The in this, income tax, the rates this, are mentioned in the income tax act, and as yeah. per that, we have to take. There is a concept the of additional rates. depreciation there. The additional depreciation is there, but additional depreciation is based on the uh, that is given in the first year, and that is based on the. Uh, the days it has been put to use for uh, as in if it is put to use uh, in the first day for less than 180 days in that case uh, uh, the rates will be different hmm. so the additional depreciation concept is also regarding where the asset is placed the uh, just because the shifts are more we cannot uh, put uh, more depreciation so neither in income tax nor in income ta- nor in schedule 2 schedule 2 we can charge additional depreciation right and it prescribes rates so assuming assume that you know the management is taking a deviation from the rates assuming that it prescribes rates 
is taking a deviation from the rates prescribed by schedule 2 uh and they and so what should they do like what sort of disclosures they need to give in their financial statement how can they disclose the same in their financial statements in the notes to accounts uh, uh, they will disclose that uh, this is the depreciation method and this is the rate that they have taken so it's an accounting uh, like an accounting estimate they can uh, uh, if there is change in accounting estimate then they have to disclose it in their notes Hmm. Assume that I'm buying a machine, and uh, you know there is no procurement process, proper procurement process in place in our organization. We are relatively a smaller firm, a new firm. We are a startup. We do not have any finance people in the organization who can take care of take care of our assets or procurement part. What possibly could go wrong if there is no formal procurement? process in place what are the risks associated to the procurement here so if there is no formal process as to who will uh, uh, who will make the invoice then who will uh, authenticate it then there mm -hmm. might be problems as to the uh, maker checker concept if the person who is making that person is only approving then uh, if that person is doing any uh, any uh, fraud then that will not be checked he can make a bogus uh, or fake uh, invoices uh, to uh, Uh, to accelerate to decelerate the sales and to uh, tamper with the profit and uh, that will be affected uh, he can also do uh, he can also make invoices and take the uh, the goods home uh, which will in books uh, it will be shown as uh, it, it is a sale but uh, uh, the revenue has not been earned from that and he is uh, uh, that employee is enjoying on that and also they might uh, if the correct financials uh, the if the, the financials don't give a true and correct picture then ultimately the profit and the position no no we are not talking about financials ma'am we just need okay. to know the risk associated to the procurement process that's all Sir, even uh, sir, if the if the entries are not recorded properly, the creditors won't be uh, receiving the payment on time. Just the procurement process. Yeah, the procurement process. The vendors will not, not the accounting part. Time. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, the vendors will uh, vendors will not get the payment in time. There will not be not a good coordination with the vendors, and if a. Uh, uh uh so the quality of goods that we they, they need to be tenders raised and the lowest court needs to be chosen so if the proper process is not followed we might be uh, selecting that uh, we might be selecting goods at a higher rate than what is available uh, and uh, in in the market and there can also be chance that we are buying low quality products uh, if there was a systemization or a hierarchy to be followed then a high, or a person to whom you have to report to then the, the lower management will definitely make sure that they are contacting the correct people having the correct quality uh, as your no proper process is there uh, many companies also follow the just in time process which is actually that order only that much stock which is required uh, for the production so uh, they might be uh, ordering a lot of stuff which is not required and then the products uh, the raw materials might go obsolete uh, there are different uh, th there are uh, industries where the tastes and preferences change with time to time so uh, as per that if they are ordering a lot then they will go obsolete and uh, it will hamper the uh, the mm. company uh they, it will be a loss to the company so there needs to be a proper uh, organization and hierarchy and structure to be followed okay what else uh there can also be issues regarding uh, the regarding the management space regarding the uh, contacting with the the transport companies uh, also uh, the the issue, there might be issues with them also and uh, uh, even the cost in related to them that might be different if that person who is uh, making who is who is in charge of that he has for example given the uh, contract of uh, getting the products from the supplier to the factory location to a person who is his relative so that person might be charging us rate which is more than what is uh, there in the market so ultimately that will lead to more cost to the the uh, company okay fine fine so you have mentioned index 116 in your cv so have you practically worked with index 116 but i have not practically worked with index 116 but i am conversant with it <clears throat> conversant okay so what are the exemptions available to lessee uh, under index 116 
so if the asset uh, uh, if the the time period of the lease is uh, small like uh, it is of a uh, uh, 12 months or uh, less then he does not have to have to uh, record it as a lease liability and also if the uh, value is a it's a low value asset then also it's not necessary for him to record it as lease liability he'll record the lease ex as an expense in the pnl uh, and if the low value will have to be judged depending on the situation the of that uh, Uh, company, the judge management has to take the judgment. Usually, it is on the basis whether that uh, asset, uh, the value that we are getting from that asset, is not dependent on any other asset, and mm. it is uh, so. These are some measures on which uh, they have to take a decision as to whether it is a. So one is one is uh, low value you know, asset, and one is the low low uh, the lease term is twelve months or less. Okay, fine. Assume that you are taking some machine, let's say a crusher. You generate a lot of waste, and you are buying a. You are taking a crusher on lease from me. I am a you know vendor who provides crushers on lease, and now I have the ability, or I can replace that crusher every day. That's a portable crusher. I can give you a new crusher every day. Uh, you are least bothered what crusher you are using. You just need a crusher every day. I said I told you that no problem. We'll give you a crusher. But we'll keep replacing the crusher whenever we want, right? Uh, my question is, and you are paying fifty thousand per month to get this crusher on your unit every day, so you're paying that rent to me, right? Is it a lease contract? No, sir. It is not a lease contract as per India's one one six. That has to be an identified asset. The, the, under the contract, it has to be identified asset, which is given on a uh, uh, lease, and the control is transferred uh, to the lessee. And uh, here, it is not an identified asset as it is replaceable. Uh, one day he will give uh, one uh, one uh, crusher, another day he will give another crusher. This this is not a separate or distinct uh, uh, asset. So uh, this is this is not, and also here we see that uh, the control is not transferred. The right to use the asset, uh, it, it should be said that the lessee can use it the way he wants. So uh, this is not a lease contract here. Okay, and how to determine whether the right of right to use the control of asset is transferred or not? Uh, so for that, the right to use the 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 lessee should have the right to use it as to he can sublease it, he can use it for generating the future economic benefits, and uh, it it is his choice how he he wants yeah. to use it. So that is the right to use. But keep keeping that in mind, it is not that uh, he can use it any which way. There there are uh, things in the contract like uh, what uh, for example. Uh, For for example, uh, uh, that this crusher can be used for only certain things and not for certain things. If that is given in the contract, then we can't use it for those unpermissible things. Okay. Um. So let's say you are uh, you know analyzing a balance sheet in Kindle and you found out that the lease liability is increasing and the finance cost is going down. What could be the possible reasons for this? The lease liability is increasing. Yeah, in the balance sheet, the lease liability is increasing, but in the P and L statement, when you, uh, you know, analyze and observe certain figures, the finance cost is decreasing from last year. What could be the possible? The finance cost can be uh on due to uh various uh factors and divisions. It is not just limited to the uh the interest expense in the lease because the entry is the interest expense able to lease liability. We record the lease liability on day one at the present value, and uh, then we keep on unwinding it. So and th then the entry becomes interest expense to lease liability. So uh as per that, the interest expense should rise, but here only the lease liability is rising. Yes, the lease liability uh will rise this interest expense uh uh because as the years are decreasing, so uh. It's the present value we are. Uh, the interest expense will reduce because we are making payments to them. So the interest expense over the time will reduce because it is calculated. But the lease liability the is increasing. Balance. The lease liability will increase because interest expense to lease liability. We are. It's a financial liability that uh, uh, that will increase uh, in the books, and then later on we'll do the payment as to lease liability to bank. Okay. It has. Let's assume that financial. Finance cost has substantially gone down. So there can be other factors also. Uh, like the the there might be change in the rate. Uh, okay, rate. fine. Yes. What else? 
they can be uh, it might be possible that there is a modification of the contract and now for example earlier two three uh, assets were taken on lease now or uh, the asset quantity is reduced so they have to modify the contract uh, the term period might have gotten reduced of the lease period uh, mm. so as per that also the expense might uh, have deferred okay we might have made some payment okay of what the lease some payment of the lease liability we have done in the uh, middle okay let's say you are you have to you are taking a house on lease or rent and you have to pay house tax every year right to the government will this be a part of lease liability while computing lease liability will you include this amount for computing the lease liability uh Taxes are uh, not to be included in lease liability. It is not something which we are giving to that uh, uh, that lesser. It is something we are paying to the government. Mm -hmm. It is not included in the lease liability. Assume that in this case, uh, the lesser is paying to the government. We have to reimburse the amount to the lesser. So still, it is not related to the lease. We will only take the fixed amount or the variable amount which is related to the lease. So, mm -hmm. or so it it will not be included. Are you sure? As for what I can recall, I um. Okay. Uh, what will be the treatment of you know uh, ESOPs being issued or ESOP uh, ESOPs being issued to the employees in a startup? Will it be categorized as financial liability or what? Like as per index one zero nine, what would be its treatment? ESOP is not a financial liability because financial liability means the contractual obligation that the that the company has. Uh, that involves a uh, uh, an outflow of that. There's a contractual obligation that they will pay cash or they will pay any other financial asset. And as per definition of financial asset, the company's own shares are not a financial asset. So here, if the company is giving ESOP, which is actually basically company shares, it is categorized as equity. So this year is not a financial liability. So where will you disclose this particular thing in, in you know, in, balance sheet? In, in, in other equity. Okay. So what are your hobbies, Sita? So my hobbies are I love dancing, uh, and uh, I like uh, indulging myself in art and craft and painting. Uh, I also love traveling, and I have done a lot of adventure sports. I have done skydiving, rafting, zip lining, and it's in my bucket list to do uh, other adventure sports also, like scuba diving and bungee jumping. Mm -hmm. so, and uh, I want to do it from the one of the highest uh, peaks. So, but for that, I need to get a, a, a some more courage. Okay, so you seem to be someone who is, uh, you know, too enterprising and uh, adventurous. Uh, will you be, you know, happy serving in a plant where there is nothing, no facilities available, just a normal quarter to stay? Uh, will it be yes, okay for you? Yes, sir, I'll be okay because these are what I, I know how to categorize my uh, professional life and how to categorize my personal life. My hobbies, mm. which are dancing and painting, that I can do anywhere. Whether mm. I'm in on mountains or whether I'm at a plant, I can do that mm. stuff. I also enjoy I'm penning down poetry uh, when I'm calm and I want to uh, let go of all my thoughts in a free flow manner. So mm. I also involve myself in poetry. So I think if it's, it's, it's a calmer location, then uh, uh, I might pursue uh, that hobby of mine uh, in a more uh, uh, expressive way. Okay, great. What is IRR? Sure, sure. Can I please have water? Yeah, yeah, please, please. Now, yeah, IRR? IRR means internal rate of return. It means the rate of return uh, at which the the inflow, the present value of the inflows of the company will equal to be will be equal to the outflows. 
so uh, this is the rate at which uh, uh, the company will be at a, a position at which uh, it will be earning uh, the present value of inputs will be equal to the present value of the outputs okay no but in layman terms so sir like, if you have explain it to someone who doesn't understand finance how do you yeah. explain so, it so sir we cannot explain uh, i i have to uh, link it uh, with the other uh, the the rate of return like the required rate of return for example the internal rate of return is uh, for say 10% because this is the expected rate that i will receive uh, uh, but uh, the rate that i am actually receiving from my investments is for example 8% so here i am at a condition where my inflows are less than my outflows so it is not a correct decision to invest here so that is why irr is relevant and important so we have to uh, make a comparison of this expected rate with the rate that we are getting and uh, then we have to decide on the investment decisions okay and can there be two irrs of the same project IRRs of the same project, sir. So they can be if the life is different. Uh, if the we have categorized the project uh, in such a way that uh, the life mm -hmm. is different, then IRRs can be both. Because okay. then the inflows will be different. For example, for one component, the inflows is ranging two three years. Another, it is ranging to five years. So, uh, in that case, it can be different. Okay, so life is one factor. What are the factors that can uh, vary our IRRs? Sir, the uh, the cap. The, the project that we are undergoing uh, hmm. that that can be a factor and uh, the project i did not get your point like what in a project for example that portion is more uh, significant but another portion is less less significant portion for example there is a project and uh, that we have to uh, The, the amount can be different of both the things that we have categorized into. So we have categorized into. I mean, I'm not two. getting these words. Portion, both the things. Okay. What are these two things? Uh, like uh, we have taken a capital budgeting project, uh, wherein uh, there is a house. One will be one floor will be completed in two years. Other will be completed in one year. So the that there is uh, the life of one uh, one of the floor is two years and other life floor is, is fine one year. life and uh, life we, is point we might be involving more uh, like we are also involving interior designing uh, person in one project so the cost will be more uh, in another it is just a for example a parking so you, what you are trying to say is cash outflow and cash inflows yeah the amount involved the cash in that cash means the cash outflow cash outflows yeah so if they vary, the IR different. will change, right? So not the IR. The IR will not change as per the inflows. No, I, I, I mean the impact it has. I, I'll change. Okay, the... fine, fine, fine. No problem. That's all from my side. Any questions? Yes, sir. I want to uh, know the question of that balance sheet P and L. That is, the company had only one asset, and how will we prepare the P and L balance sheet? Simple, uh, you, you know, in P and L. Yeah, yeah, definitely. In P and L, you will charge depreciation, and against which there will be a loss that you're going to book because there are no revenues, no expenses. On in the balance sheet, uh, you'll show asset and net value. That means gross minus accumulated depreciation, and on the liability side, you will show. Equity or capital less the loss that you have incurred, and this is how the balance sheet is going to tell. I will give some more. So PNL. PNL is fine, but not the balance sheet. Yeah, in balance sheet, I could not uh, think of capital. Think of the reserve and surplus will go in negative. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thank you, sir. Okay. Thank HR so will get much. back to you. Thank you so much, sir. I had a. a Great time and and thank you for so much of your time. Same here, same. Thank you.